Hello, and welcome to the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast, where culture, communication, and context meet at work. In this podcast, you will discover what cultural influences have formed the careers of noteworthy leaders in a variety of professions by exploring the groups that shaped who they are today. Learn about the collective context and experiences that affect their worldview, leadership style, workplace communication, and behavior. I'm your host, Marie Gervais. You can connect with me by email with marie at shiftworkplace.com. Check out my LinkedIn profile and my company website, shiftworkplace.com. Judy Lynn Archer said, Money doesn't buy everything, but it certainly brings peace and security to a person's heart. It's my responsibility to get women to that point of saying, I can do it, and I can make a hell of a living doing it. And she should know. Since she rose from poverty to philanthropy by first working in the trades and then helping other women access training and find work in industry. As one of the founding members of Women Building Futures, Judy Lynn Archer is a passionate advocate of women working in non-traditional jobs. I know you will enjoy her passion, authenticity, and down-to-earth approach to work and culture. I'm your host, Marie Gervais, and today is my pleasure to introduce to you my esteemed colleague, Judy Lynn Archer, who has a very interesting career trajectory and started out doing a whole lot of different small jobs, moved into trucking, then library science, and after that, took up a career as the advocate for women in non-traditional careers with Women Building Futures. She was the CEO of Women Building Futures for 13 years and became very dedicated to the development of women in non-traditional careers. She followed that particular job with a career in philanthropy, which I'm going to ask her to speak to us a little bit about, and has something to do with developing women over the long term. And so, Judy, I'm wondering if you could fill out that introduction a little bit more and tell us some more about yourself and about also the philanthropist that you have become. Well, thank you, Marie. I think, I think in my early years, um, working in the trucking industry and working in small towns, I, I come from British Columbia. It was the norm for most people to be working in the lumber industry, tow boating, all kinds of what we would call blue collar work. And that's where I grew up. And my, my work life became very similar to that. And I got into trucking, I think, because I did think it was normal and uh, a wonderful profession. What I did learn from that career in trucking was that women can do anything we want to do if we put our mind to it. It was the most challenging of careers for me, but it was also the most wonderful. Later on, as I grew a little older and realized that I didn't want to be doing that all my life, I I did go back to school and and go into library science, and I loved that work as well. Uh, It may seem a little odd, but there's a bit of a story there. But anyway, that's what I did. And what happened out of that is that I ended up getting a job with the provincial government at the time for not a long period of time. I think it was three years or something, where I got to work with individuals who were looking to understand what would best suit them for a career. And I think it was during those years where I got to work with a lot of career counselors and people whose profession it was to help people work through and think through all the things that one would might want to, you know, think about before entering into a career. And it was really a a learning experience for me. It was wonderful. And it also, of course, you know, once you are immersed in a, in a certain culture like that, you begin to think about it from your own perspective. What might I have done differently? Was my career really just a haphazard pathway or was it all of it leading me toward something really fabulous and helping me to position myself to be ready when the right opportunity came along. And I think in looking back, I would say that the time that I met the founding members of Women Building Futures, for me, right at that moment, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, my whole career, although haphazard and weird as it might sound, I think it all led me to the moment of realizing that this is where I could really deploy the skills 
that I've learned throughout my life to do something meaningful and that would actually make a contribution. It's a really great story and thank you so much for sharing it. It shows all the different things that you are able to do and, and move forward with in your life and how you showed flexibility and reflection really on thinking about how to move forward with your life in ways that would be of service to others and that would use all of the experiences and talents that you had. So I'm going to ask you if you could reflect a little bit on your childhood and think, are there a couple of incidents that you think helped form you and make you the person that you are today? I'm not sure about specific incidents, uh, Marie, but for sure, my childhood was one of unending worry about where we were going to be living. Would there be any food for supper? How on earth were we going to pay the bills at the end of the month? That was just an ongoing reality for us. So I think it's fair to say that childhood wasn't the happy time that I think childhood should be. It was just always worry, worry, worry about money, money, money. There was also very little uh, understanding or interest or empathy about whatever problems that I might be having. There was just none of that. So I think at the end of the day, though, um, I I left home very early in life. Um, But one of the things I think that I took from all of that, you know, at the end of the day, is that we do need to solve our own problems. You know, that was hard for me because I I did want help when I was young. But I think it also did position me to be a problem solver extraordinaire. I'm looking for problems so that I can cut them off at the pass before they become a problem. And I think that served me well uh, in my later years. So, yeah, rather than incidences, it was just that unending worry and instability, fear, uh, unhappiness, and And just a desperation of wanting to get out of that circumstance and make sure that my life would not be the same. And it hasn't been the same because you're not in that situation and you haven't been for a very long time. How did you move yourself out of that? Because many times people who are trapped in this, I can't survive mentality, they stay there. It's hard for them to move out. How did you move out? I think it's very hard and we're all so different. So certainly, you know, whatever I've done in my life, um, I'm not saying that, oh, everybody should be able to, you know, pick themselves up. I think unless that you've experienced whatever challenges that other people have, you know, we just cannot judge um, other people's experience. So I think for me, there was just really no other option. It was sort of freeing. It was going to be up to me to, I was either going to make it or not. And it's always been that way. And so I think luckily, whether I was born with just a sort of a a head down, go getter, you know, unstoppable sort of spirit within myself, I'm not sure what it was. But um, I have worked very hard to always, you know, number one, have a job, work, save money, try to create a future for myself that would give myself financial freedom And therefore, I really have always felt if I have financial freedom, I would have freedom and ability to do what I wanted in life. I wasn't sure what that was. I never did have a career goal in mind. And I think that goes back to that sort of, you know, just doing manual work, whatever came up, that's what I would do. But always it was for me, the goal to be financially independent and never have to rely on anyone for anything. Now, That also has a downside to it as well. You become fiercely independent and and that can sometimes work against you. But I guess I chose that path. But I think also throughout that whole lifetime, it also gave me an opportunity to have some empathy uh, about other people's pathways. We didn't all grow up in a home where university was going to be the career path. And so I think for a lot of people like me, we find ourselves sort of drifting, um, whether that's at 20 or at 30 or whatever, we find ourselves drifting because we just haven't landed on that area where we feel that we can really excel. I think for me, what was lucky was that, again, that I was talking about you know, being able to see opportunity and be prepared for it. The day that I met the founding members of Women Building Futures, the first time I heard them tell me their vision for Women Building Futures, that's when I knew for sure, right in my gut, I thought, oh my God, all these years of doing all that crappy work and manual labor and working so hard has led me to this point where I, 
I believe I have something to really offer this group that nobody else has. That was a turning moment for me. Hmm. That's a really, really great because before you thought you were aimless, but actually you were on a path. It's almost like you stumbled on the destination by accident and you went, whoa, this is it. You know, I think that most of us at some point, we do have these things come our way. You know, the only thing that prevents us from taking those things up, we are either really well prepared and we can recognize that opportunity or we don't see it. Yeah. So I think part of it is really learning how to somehow, um, how to prepare yourself so that if and when something really great comes along, and it's often, I think it's part luck, it's timing, it's all kinds of things, but it's also partly our, I always felt my responsibility was to do everything I could, you know, to prepare myself to, toward Whatever it was that was coming, I didn't know what it was, but I found it that day. And I was lucky enough to recognize it that day. Yes. Being open to possibilities is really important. And then being willing to take action once you find one is the other thing. Uh, so that's, that's the other piece that trips people up. Either they don't see the possibility or once they see it, they don't take the action step that's required because uh, things don't come together and, and until you take some action, which I think you're pretty good at. So I wanted to ask you a question about groups that you might have been born into. So you said you were born into a blue collar community in, in BC. Is there something from that, you've already described a little bit, but is there something from that you think has helped you really form your leadership style? I think if I were to sum it up, it would be to realize that many, many individuals, you know, don't get the support they need in their early life. I think that there's a big difference between individuals who are surrounded by family who support them, who believe in them, first of all, and support them and encourage them and engage with them. I think there is a just a difference there than for people who don't have that. From my experience, I believe that I have empathy and some level of understanding for those individuals who for whatever reason, are struggling. I think often we lose our self-confidence. When nobody else believes in us, uh, I think it's pretty easy to stop believing in yourself as well. Uh, there's a lot more reasons to do that than to believe in yourself or to, to create that and strengthen that belief in ourselves. I would say that, yeah, my, the one thing I did learn in all of that is to try not to judge uh, other people, to take them as who they say they are, to believe what they say they are about themselves and uh, to go from there and, and try to work together. And that must have helped you a lot when you're working in Women Building Futures, because I'm thinking that you have women coming from a variety of different backgrounds, correct? Yes. And they would, and a lot of the backgrounds would be things that sometimes people would say, oh, this person isn't going to make it or they're not, going to, they're not the right material for us. And you wouldn't necessarily judge them, right? You'd say, let's find out what your skills are. Let's find out what your talents are. Um, let's give it a try. I work very hard not to judge. I mean, I think it's, it seems to be, judgment seems to be part of the human condition and something that we need to be aware of and work against doing that. Um, and yes, at Women Building Futures, we see women from all walks of life, actually. Um, women that have gone through university and who, for whatever reason, are just not happy with the career that they chose. We see lots of women like that. And we also see lots of women who, like me, find themselves drifting and not doing well, not really understanding where their strengths lie. No one's ever taken the time to help them think that through. And of course, for many women, you know, there's all kinds of other things that ha can happen in their life to create obstacles for them. And I'm very familiar with some of those things that can happen to women. You know, I can empathize. On the other hand, I do know that we need to get past those things and take advantage of what opportunities there are out there and turn those opportunities you know, to our advantage in a way that's empowering for ourselves, in ways that we can actually turn around and contribute to making the world a better place. Sorry if that sounds a little hokey, but I do believe that that's part of our responsibility and it's an honor to be able to do that. But it takes a while for some of us to get there. So at Women Building Futures, our job is to really be in their corner for these women who are saying, hey, I, you know, I really, I want to do something different. I, 
I think I can. I'm just, I don't know what. And I, I just might need a little bit of uh, some support here. That's our job is to help these women find a way to say, yes, this is something I can do. It's going to be tough, but by gosh, I can do it. Other women are doing it and I can make a hell of a living doing it. And in so doing, you know, once again, I mean, I know that money doesn't buy love or good health or happiness, but having a stable and financially secure life, having a home so your kids can sleep in the same bed every night, they're going to eat at the same table every night, that can bring a level of security and peace to a person's heart in a way that nothing else can. That's what we do at Women Building Futures. And that is so important because no matter where you go in the world, women are, even in the most advanced situations, earning 75% of what men are earning. And uh, there are very few, pro for few professions where women can actually earn a decent living and be economically sufficient. And that's something that's still taking a lot of, uh, of effort to bring equity to the workplace. And especially because so many women are also single parents. And they not only are taking care of themselves at a much lower economic level, they have children to take care of and extended family to take care of, and yet they have less resources. And uh, they aren't prepared to look for resources either because we aren't, haven't been in the past preparing women to think that they need to be economically viable. It's changing, but we're still a long way from where we need to be for sure. We are for sure, Marie, but on the other hand, there is a real opportunity right now for women in Canada. I mean, if there was ever a time for women to come into the industry, and when I say the industry, I'm talking about the, you know, the bigger picture of construction, oil and gas, mining, all of those types of industries. Um, it is now just because people are retiring in droves. So all the people, the men uh, specifically, who have held all those trades jobs for all these years, they are retiring in droves just like every other industry. And women, and certainly underemployed women, are that industry's largest source of worker. So it's an incredible opportunity for the industry and for women. Part of the issue is, is helping women understand and see this opportunity, because typically it's not within our frame of reference. Most, most of us don't wake up and think, hey, you know, I think I'll be a boilermaker. Or, hey, uh, I'm going to be a structural steel manufacturer. We, we just, uh, we don't know anything about those things. And we don't realize, of course, because of that, we don't realize the benefits of going into those kinds of uh, professions. And the, the benefits, not just the financial benefit, but being able to do that kind of work can bring women tremendous, a sense of self-confidence and esteem that you just can't get anywhere else. I mean, you get fit, you stay fit every day. Um, there's a lot of incredible benefits for women to come into this industry. But most women, many women still, we just don't think about it. And even if we did, we would think it's not within our grasp. Well, it is still a predominantly male industry. And that's why Women Building Futures came about to help change that. And so for me, having worked in a kind of a related industry, I do know some of the challenges for women uh, that are coming into these industries. But I also know that it's challenging for the guys as well. So it's just like anything at all. You know, when we have a better understanding of what everyone perceives the challenges to be, it helps to prepare us for solving any problems that come up. So we don't need to be afraid. We can walk in and be confident that we can be part of this industry. We do have something to offer. And if and when an issue should arise, we can be right in there helping to solve that issue and carry on. Right. So I, I'm thinking about this from a cultural perspective. So you've got the culture of the trades. You've got the culture of construction. You've got the culture of oil and gas industry. You've got male-dominated work culture. There's also female-dominated work culture. And then there are work cultures that are mixed. So um, when you have been preparing women for the workforce, what did you put into that preparation that would help them to understand how to negotiate that culture that's different from what they were used to? Well, the, the programming at Women Building Futures is really thorough and comprehensive. It's not just learning the skills that are you know needed uh, for these types of trades. And we do definitely do that. But as you say, I think 
And I think most people would agree. It's the workplace culture in any workplace culture that either propels us forward or, or makes us leave. Typically, it's nothing to do with the training or the skills or anything like that. It's the culture of the surroundings, the people, the, the social norms in that environment. I think in any profession where it is dominated by one gender, the other gender typically is going to experience challenges that the predominant gender has no idea that, are, that, that they're even challenges. It's normal for them. And they don't realize that someone coming in it may not be as, as, you know, normal or it may be kind of unsettling or you may be taken aback at some point and think, oh, what? And I also think that one of the other complicating factors is, now that, again, this is just my opinion, Marie, and my lifetime of working, it brings me to this. I believe that men and women are quite different in how we perceive the world, how we solve problems, how we communicate. So for women to come into an environment that is really, truly, um, predominantly, you know, male, it's a, it is a different culture. It's a great culture, I believe. I couldn't have been happier working in that culture. But it was definitely different, and it will be different for women who have never worked in that type of culture, for sure. So what we do at Women Building Futures is we walk women through what we know about that culture and and some of the things that they may experience. Now, things are changing in that industry, and they've changed significantly over the last decade. But it is still predominantly one gender. And so I think most women would you know, agree that there are some things when it's in an, in a mostly male environment. And uh, so what we try to do is help women understand how we can work within that environment, go home at the end of the day, feeling great about coming back the next day, how we can work side by side with men who may perceive us in a certain way so we can help them understand why we are there, what we are bringing to that job site, what our focus is. And the focus is about being the best coworker for that team or, or an excellent team player for that, for that team, for that job that day, and really try to focus in on how to take any opportunity that comes up to turn to our advantage, to, to help us fit into that workplace, and to help us understand from the men's perspective what issues they may think that exist, whether they do or not. And there are some definite differences in the way women and men approach work. And uh, I have a friend who's an electrician, a man who's an electrician, and he said that his company went out of their way to try and hire women electricians. And when they reached the point where they had about 50%, it was the first time he'd ever been in, in a workplace where there were equal numbers of men and women, and they were all qualified electricians. He said it was like um, a quantum leap for the organization. What happened was all of a sudden, everybody was able to be really who they were. Before that, all the men were kind of putting on it, kind of a, there's a, there's a male camaraderie and male sort of facades and there's things they're very honest about and a lot of things they're not honest about. And then there were lots of issues that they had that it's the same thing you have if you have predominantly female, you have different kinds of issues that come up. But at any rate, he said what happened was that the entire organization moved forward in a quantum leap in ways they had never imagined before because of the synergy of having a workforce that was men and women in equal numbers, all equally qualified to do the task. And the main thing that he saw was that people started consulting each other and recognizing each other's talents in ways that they hadn't been before. And so I don't know if that's something that you've heard about or that you experienced yourself, but um, I've been in myself in both situations and in mixed situations. And I've always found it hard to establish my credibility as a woman until I got really gray. And then I think I moved into grandmother status. <laughs> But um, I had to really work at establishing my credibility and being heard. But then once I was heard, it was good. Then we were like peer and I didn't have issues. But it, it took effort, like a lot of effort. I had to be diplomatic and I had to do it in ways that, I, that were not threatening. Personally, I would never have been threatened by the things that the men that I was working with would have been threatened by. Like wouldn't even have crossed my mind, but it crossed their minds. So it was something yeah. I had to take into consideration. And yes. it, it was worth it because it ended up being such a, an agreeable place to work because of that, because of having put that effort into it and, and all of us being able to respond to each other in, in a more authentic way. Yes, I absolutely would agree with everything that you've just said. 
And in diversity, it is key, absolutely, for all those reasons that you've just said, Marie. So you've already spoken about this, but you know, there's temperament, which is what we're born with. Some people tend to be very tenacious, and I think that's probably you. <laughs> um, uh, other, other people tend to be very empathetic, uh, or they tend to be more generous, right? So you have certain characteristics that you're born with and certain traits that you're born with. That's your temperament. It doesn't change. And then there's the personality, the stuff that you've acquired over time from your experiences and, and how you've chosen to respond to them. So let's look at temperament first. What would you say is some of something in your temperament that makes you who you are? Oh, I think tenacity. It sums me up. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone more tenacious than I. And again, I think it's just, you know, from a lifetime, you realize that if you really want to make something happen, you need to do it or it probably won't get done. It's just kind of, that's just the way of the world. So I'm one of those that if I really want something to happen, then I will make that happen. I don't know how to describe it other than tenacity. What about personality? Saying something you would have learned over time and then you would have picked up or developed consciously. Like um, one of the people that I interviewed said that for him, he had to learn to be patient because he's real quick study. <laughs> and he learns things so fast uh, that everything feels really slow around him. And he made a conscious effort to develop patience. And actually, when I first met him, I thought he was one of the most patient people I've ever met. Like, that's what stood out for me. So what about you? Is there something that you think you've learned over the years? What I learned uh, from my whole the trucking and all of that kind of, if I think that one thing that I learned there was to make sure that in everything I did to be of, of, um, of help to others, be of service. Mm -hmm. I think that the reason that I was able to do the work and be really good at it and be able to ask for help when I needed it is because I learned very quickly that I needed to also offer help as quickly as I would have had to ask for it and be there to help others when they needed it. That was the first big learning for me. And the second big learning for me was when I started working with Women Building Futures, it was one of the first times I've ever really just worked predominantly with women. And I found it to be a very different working environment. I mean, I did have empathy, but I, I think it's fair to say that in my young working life, I did not employ that particular temperament. Um, I was only focused on lining my own pocketbook. So all the work that I did leading up to Women Building Futures was all about myself. Me, 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 me. I did a good job. I helped everyone else. But it was mostly so I could be financially secure. When I met Women Building Futures, everything changed for me at that point. And I did have to learn a bit of a different approach. I mean, I already had empathy, but it took a while for that to kick back in. It took a while for me to understand how to work effectively with a large group of women. It's different. I hope nobody kills me for saying that. But... Uh, even the social workers, the original founding members of Women Building Futures, it was a challenge for us to communicate well. I think that's fair to say, and I think they would say that as well. We came from two very different worlds. See, and that really leads me into that, the next question that I wanted to ask you, which is a time that you became aware that what was normal for you was not normal for other people. And that maybe this idea is you, you had a group of social workers, they communicate and work in a certain way. You're coming from a trades background. You're used to doing things a certain way. When you first became aware of that, what was that like for you? <laughs> um, it was difficult. Um, I would have to say that I was very hard-headed and more business-oriented. I like to make decisions by myself. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's just move, 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 move toward the goal and get it achieved, whatever that is. With the social workers, there was more time for reflection and interaction and conversation and, and all of that. And I found that very, very challenging. There was more of a, that collective thinking. That for me was, oh my God. It was both the most frustrating thing I'd come up against, I think, in my lifetime for a long time, and the most exhilarating, all at the same time. And I think I had a love-hate relationship in my head with that whole thing for probably two years, the, my first two years. Um, I, what, well, what changed then? What changed was probably the first time that I ever saw a woman come through our program, and then she decided to go forward and become an apprentice, and she kept coming back. And saying, hey, this is what I'm doing now, and this is what I'm doing now, and now, and now. And, and as it went on, 
I knew her, I saw her when she first came to us. I saw her later and then later and later. And I can tell you that I have never forgotten that individual. That's what changed for me. And it brought back for me, my young life. I thought, oh my God, this individual has taken that little bit of support that we can provide and she has turned it into an unbelievable opportunity for herself. She changed her life, I can tell you. She changed her life trajectory. And for me, I began to realize that Women Building Futures had changed my life trajectory the same way. For you, the bridge was the graduates from the program were showing you the bridge between the male and the female in the workplace. And their success was what really propelled you forward to want to collaborate more, I think, with your colleagues, right? It was all about their success. Mm -hmm. I began to realize that, um, because again, I have to go back, you know, I led a very selfish existence in all those years that I was working to buy my home and buy real estate and look after myself. I didn't think about anybody. I didn't give any money. Uh, I never made a donation in my lifetime uh, up until up until recently. I did not give my time to volunteer work. I didn't do anything for anybody, just for me. That completely changed with Women Building Futures. It took time, but it was because I began to see what these women were doing with their lives because they we were had been able to be there for them at a moment when they decided, you know what, I want to do something different and I need just a little bit of support. We were able to provide that for them at that time, at that moment. So it was listening to them and seeing their faces, seeing that I really, for me, that was just a huge change of life and thought. I began to meet people who were philanthropists. They gave time. I remember meeting two individuals who told me about their volunteer work. I remember distinctly asking them, I said, you mean you don't get paid for doing all this? You're doing this on your own time. These people were working full time and they were also volunteering. And I, I couldn't believe it. When I grew up, we were on the door of uh, Salvation Army. I mean, we were one of their main uh, you know, clients. I was one of those that needed help. Until Women Building Futures, I had never met people who actually were part of that giving. These two individuals I met, they volunteered time and they gave money. I can tell you that was a life changer for me. I thought, oh my God, does that mean that, should I do the same thing? It made me think about all those things. And then you did, and you became quite a significant philanthropist. You know, what's interesting about what you're saying right now, I see two things coming full circle. So first you learned about being part of a brotherhood, and then you became part of a sisterhood. (laughs) You saw two wings of the bird, right? First you had the brotherhood wing was really strong, the sisterhood wing was way weak. Mm -hmm. Your sisterhood wing got really strong, And then they were both going together in Women Building Futures. That was the vehicle. That was the bird, right? And then the same thing happened with being on the door of poverty all the time and thinking people need to give me stuff, otherwise I can't survive. Becoming completely autonomous and self-sufficient, thinking I can do this all by my own, and then thinking, you know what? I should be giving. And when you're giving, you've come full circle. So you've developed all of these capacities from being really strong on one side to moving through to being really strong on the next side and then bringing them together. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. I used to think that the trucking life and all that stuff I did before was really great until Women Building Futures came along. And now where I sit today, I think I'm the luckiest dog alive to be able to have had (laughs) both those opportunities and come out smiling on the other side. I feel that I was able to actually make a contribution. Now, like you say, at one time in my life, that wouldn't have mattered, but now it does. And I think maybe it's part of getting older as well, where you begin to really realize, you know, our clock's ticking, man. Are we actually, you know, what happens if there is a God? What happens if I get up there and somebody is saying, okay, let's see now, I just gave you all that time. I'm sorry, what were you doing with it? At least at this point, I'll have something more to say than, yeah, you know, I I did well financially. This is so great. I just, I'm just really enjoying enjoying the way that you're speaking about about all of this. And I was just imagining you being a dog and and being really happy, you know, and running along in the field like, woohoo, I'm a lucky dog. (laughs) Um, I do feel like I'm a lucky dog. Yeah. (laughs) You have really stepped into your groove, I would say. And so I have a final, uh, well, uh, almost final question, and that is that we're reaching the end of the interview. And I'm just wondering if you were an employee and you had that luxury of being able to tell your new boss, what's the best way to work with me? What tips would you give that boss about working with you? 
what would you need to be an employee that really could produce at your highest level? Well, I'm going to answer this question, Marie, as, as though I would be that employee today at this age that I am now. And I would say that I would say to the employer to, even though I am officially a geezer, I would hope that employer would give me some credit for the experience that I bring to the job today. I've had a long life of experience and I, will, I want that employer to believe that experience, it still holds water, even though I'm a geezer. I'm going to switch that around a little bit and I'm going to say, you're going to walk in and talk to that employer and say, you are going to do so much better by working with me because look at the experience I have and the wealth that I bring to this organization that you would never be able to access otherwise. And I wouldn't mention anything about geezerhood because really what it is, is elderhood. And you're in the position of being able to give advice. You're in the position of being able to be the expert in the room. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I do believe I have something to bring, to offer. I think sometimes people can dismiss the value that elders can offer. Well, it's at a great loss to them and to society if they do. I would agree. I'm thinking there's a way for people to get a hold of you. I'm going to put your email into the show notes. Is there anything else or any cause that you would like to promote that you would like the audience to know about? Yes, actually, Marie, thank you. When I retired from Women Building Futures, I wanted to do something. I wanted to make a statement that would convey how grateful I am uh, and was for the experience and the opportunity to build Women Building Futures and to all the people. I wanted to say thank you and really acknowledge all those people, our stakeholders, our clients, our partners, all the people that came forward and just really uh, worked with us to bring that organization to where it is today. I decided to create an endowment fund. I called it the Judy Lynn Archer Endowment Fund for lack of a better, couldn't think of anything else. And I made a $100,000 donation to start that fund. And I am now raising money. I'm raising that fund. I'm trying to find other individuals, men and women, who would be interested and share my passion for helping women to get into this industry through the programming and housing at Women Building Futures. We built Women Building Futures. We built the facility, which does include the workshops, the, you know, the, the welding, and, but it also includes uh, housing upstairs where women can live up to a maximum of two years with their children so they can get what they need in order to move on in the direction they have chosen and be successful at it. The endowment fund that I established, it will help cover the costs for the Women Building Futures housing and the training programs. I think there's a lot of individuals out there who would like to support women going through something like this. And so I would encourage anyone, if they're interested in joining me and joining that passion at Women Building Futures, to give me a call and let's just chat about it and see if they'd like to get involved. I think it's part of that opportunity to build a legacy. I had never really thought about, you know, legacy and all of that before. But when I was thinking about what could I do to let people know how appreciative I really am, I thought, you know, it's easy to say these things. It's another thing to actually put your money where your mouth is. $100,000 for me was a, that's a large amount of money. I am not a wealthy person. And I want to do more. I would like to bring that fund up to $1 million within the next couple of years and build it even further out. So thank you for that opportunity, Marie, to talk about that. And uh, I think building a legacy is something that is a worthy uh, way to spend time. Thank you. Judy, that has been very, very interesting to hear your story and your insights and to be a part of this interview. And thank you for accepting and being willing to go through with the interview questions. I really enjoyed it. I know the audience is going to love it. Is there a website or any page where you would like people to get in touch with you? Or do you just want them to call you? Um, So I can get that information from you later. We'll put that in the show notes. And people who are interested in finding out what they can do and how they can participate in Women Building Futures Endowment Fund and the Judy Lynn Archer's Endowment Fund Initiative, then they can do that. So thanks again, and I wish you all the best with your new initiative in uh, building up this endowment fund. And I'm sure it will be as magnificent as the rest of your life has been. Thank you so much, Marie. I hope you enjoyed listening to this interview with Judy Lynn Archer as much as I enjoyed doing it. We can all learn something about overcoming obstacles 
and reflecting on our career path from her inspiring approach. She is truly an example of real grit and tenacity. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast, where culture, communication, and context meet at work. Make sure you check out the show notes for highlights, takeaways, links, and contact information for our speaker. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you for helping spread the word about the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. I simply couldn't do it without you.